over the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a look at Jesus and his connection to uh, some of the Old Testament stories and individuals, how the Old Testament was pointing to him or how he was the fulfillment of some of the things that take place in the Old Testament. And, and I, I hope that what I present, that it will make some sense to you, uh, that it will be eye-opening uh, in, in some respects. But today we're going to be looking at Jesus and creation and his connection with creation. Uh, and we know that he was, you know, John chapter 1 tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. How Jesus was part of the creation story. He's part of the Godhead. Um, but I want to start off with the fact that, number one, that Jesus is the true light. He's the light of the world. Back in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And so at the very beginning, God creates heavens and, uh, heavens and the earth. And the first thing he says, let there be light. And what was that light there for? To expose the darkness, to remove the darkness from the land. Well, Jesus comes on this earth and, and he's walking this planet. He's doing his ministry. And we come to a point in John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so the, the creation story starts off, let there be light. The reality of that was Jesus is the light. Because God said, let there be light, we have the sun, the moon, the stars, so that we can see during the day and even at night because of the light that is there. And Jesus comes and he says, I am the true light. Anybody who follows me walks in the light. They're no longer in darkness. And the importance of having that light in our life. Along with being the light, number two, we need to realize that Jesus is the land. The promised land. Again, Genesis chapter 1, verses 9 and 10 says, And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and, it, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And how this connects to Jesus is, in, in Scripture, I think many times, Water often represented death. And so death covered the whole earth. There was, there was water through the whole earth, and God separated the waters and made dry ground appear out of the waters. And so water is death, and land would represent life. He brought the land out of the water, out of death, and into life. In the same way, Jesus, he came, he lived that perfect life, he died on the cross, and he was planted into the ground, and he died. And yet, he arose from death. Out of, out of the grave, from death to life. And, and he showed that even when, when he was walking this earth, and his ministry was just starting, and he goes to John the Baptist, and he is baptized by John the Baptist. He was baptized into water, dying to self, and rising again to life. And that's where we get our baptism today. We follow in, in John the Baptist and Jesus' footsteps. You know, baptism is that outward profession of, that we're dying to ourself and rising to a new life as a new creation in Christ. And so that death to life, land coming out of the water. But more than that, there's also Exodus chapter 3, verse 17. God tells the Israelites, I have promised to bring you up out of your misery in Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, 
Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hiv Hivites, and Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And what God was saying is, I'm taking you out of, out of that slavery in Egypt, and I'm going to take you to a land that cannot be um, exhausted. The goodness of that land can never be taken completely away. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It is rich. It is full of blessing. And I'm going to take you into that land for you to live. And again, Jesus, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul says this about, about who Christ is. Although I am the less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless, the unsearchable, the unfathomable riches of Christ. Just like the promised land was, could not be exhausted with, with its goodness, the same is true of our Lord, that we can go into Him, the promised land, the promised Savior of the world, and His riches are unquenchable, unsearchable, boundless, unfathomable, we can never deplete who Jesus is. And so he represents the land, or land represents who he is. The land coming out of the water, the promised land, um, and the land who is Christ himself. Number three, Jesus is also the spiritual seed that we need. Genesis chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. So, you know, just like any other plant, if an apple, if you plant an apple seed, you're going to get an apple tree. If you plant a peach seed, you're going to get a peach tree. If you plant an orange seed, you're going to get an orange tree. And, um, and so... He's saying, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, according to their various kinds. And the land produce vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And, and we look at that, and that's just, that's what the world is. That's what the earth has. We have all these different plants and all these different seeds, and they all produce their, their plants according to their kinds. Well, Jesus comes along, and in John chapter 12, verses 24 to 25, he makes this statement. He says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And so Jesus is saying, just like those seed-bearing plants, that he is the spiritual seed for us. A, a kernel of wheat, unless it falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. But if it goes into the ground and dies, it will come up out of the ground and produce many seeds according to their kinds. And so Jesus was saying, I am that seed, I am that kernel of wheat, and I am going into the ground, I am dying. But when I arise from the grave, from the ground, I'm going to produce many seeds according to his kind. And we become the, out, the outgrowth of that, that death, that burial, that resurrection. And we become see, the seeds that come from that experience. And he is the spiritual seed of which we are now that spiritual seed because he died, rose again, and he has planted his seed in us by his spirit. Number four, Jesus is the last Adam. And we've, we've read this before, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. God said, let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. 
So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so we've talked about this many times before, but thinking about Jesus as the last Adam, the first Adam was given a responsibility, bear the image of God, to rule over all of creation and to be fruitful and multiply according to their kind. And we know that, that they, were, they were created in God's image and we know that they were fruitful and multiplied But when they were deceived by the serpent in the garden, they lost that rule over all creation. And because of that, Jesus had to come on the scene. He had to come to earth. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 49. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a life, uh, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of of the heavenly man. And so Jesus comes on this on this earth and he he fulfills what the first Adam was supposed to do. The first Adam, bear my image, rule over creation and be fruitful and multiply. And Jesus comes and and for for the first Adam it was all it was the physical, it was the natural. Jesus comes and he bears the image of God and he He rules over all creation, but then he becomes fruitful and multiplies in the spiritual realm. And he becomes the last Adam. He fulfills what the first Adam failed to do. And because of that, we become part of the last Adam. We become part of Christ in the fulfillment of what creation, what God intended at creation, bearing his image, ruling over the earth, and being fruitful and multiplying. So he is the last Adam. Number five, Jesus is the breath of life. He is the breath of life. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. And so God created man from the dust of the earth. He forms man in his image, but he had to breathe his life into Adam. And so he breathed into him and Adam became a living being. And again, Jesus comes, it points to Jesus. Jesus comes into this world. He does his ministry He goes to the cross, he's placed in a tomb, he arises from the grave. And after he arises, he spends 40 days among the people. And one of those instances, he comes to his disciples that were meeting in that locked room. John chapter 20, verses 21 and 22, where it says, Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He is the breath of life. God breathed life into Adam. And because of that, we have the physical breath so that we can walk on this earth. But through Jesus, he gives us the breath of life, the spiritual breath of life. He tells his disciples, he breathes on them, and he tells them, receive the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we, too, receive the Spirit. He is breathing into us. We already have the physical breath of life. 
But now through Christ, we have the spiritual breath of life, which is the Spirit of God residing in us. So Jesus is the breath of life. Number six, Jesus is the living water. Genesis chapter 2, verse, verses 5 and 6 and verse 10. And, and so my understanding, and I, I struggled with this, but I think I have an understanding of it now. God, in chapter 1, we, we read the creation story and all that God created and all that he did. In Genesis 2, he kind of repeats what was done in chapter 1. But some have said, well, this is actually, he created everything. He creates man in his image. Then in chapter 2, he forms the Garden of Eden. And he places man and woman in that garden. And in Genesis 2, verses 5 and 6 and 10, it says, No shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth. And there was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and from there it was separated into four headwaters. And so God provided the water that was needed for the plants to grow and to thrive. It, there wasn't rain that came. It was water from under the earth that, that percolated up and watered the ground. And there were rivers that flowed. Without there being any rain, the rivers just flowed and fed the land. Well, Jesus comes and, it's, and, and he makes this comment in John chapter 7, verse 38. He says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within you. And we need water to survive. Our bodies are a high percentage, what, 70 some percent <clears throat> water. And we need water to survive. But John, or Jesus says, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. He is that life-giving source within us by his spirit. And again, creation story points to that, points to the water uh, feeding the land, the plants, the vegetation. And Jesus comes along and he says, I am the living water. Whoever believes in me, that water from within them will grow and, and nourish them and, and help them in their lives. And the last one, number for this for today, number seven, Jesus is our identity. And this is one, again, one of those creative licenses. But the first time I heard this, it really it impacted me in a in a special way. Um, something I had never thought of before about who Jesus is. Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 to 24. So God created everything. He had created all the animals on the earth. He had the animals come to, to Adam for Adam to, to name. And, and after he named all the animals, we get to verse 20, and it says, But for Adam no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. And one of the things that, that I came across years ago was this idea that you know, God created man, created Adam from the dust of the earth. He formed him from the dust of the earth. He breathed that life into him. And when he, there was no suitable helper found, he took the rib from Adam and created Eve from the same dust of the ground. 
And because of that, she was Adam only in a different form. She had the same DNA as Adam, but in a different form. There was no difference between the two other than anatomy. And so God creates this woman from the man, from the rib, from his side. Well, then Jesus comes and he walks on this planet and he goes to, to, the, uh, to the cross. In John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30 and verse 34, he's on the cross. And it says that later knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked the sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop, plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received it, received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He died. But one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And this is that creative license. I never really thought of it before. That here was Jesus, the last Adam, goes to the cross and he dies. He's put into that deep sleep of death. And his side is opened up. And what that creative license says, he is the image of Adam. Adam's side was opened up and his bride was formed from his rib. He had the same DNA, or she had the same DNA as Adam. And here's Jesus, he's on the cross. His side is opened up and God begins forming his bride, his counterpart. Him only in a different form. And so the church of Jesus Christ is that is what came from his side, from the work that Jesus did on that cross for us. And when he arose from the dead and was able to put his spirit into us, we become his counterpart with his DNA. His DNA and our DNA, spiritual DNA, is the same because we come from Him. We were formed from Him. And when I heard that the first time, it, <laughs> it floored me. The idea of what Adam did, what God did through Adam, is the same thing He did through Christ. Through Adam, he formed a woman who would be his counterpart, his wife. And they would be one. And in the same way, Jesus, God formed his church, his bride. So that when he arose from the grave and he poured out his spirit, we become one flesh. Because we are the bride of Christ. And so we just need to remember, or not remember, I mean, just take into account so many things in the Old Testament, it points to Christ. You know, he is, he's the land. He's the living water. Um, he's our everything. He is our Lord. He is the groom. And everything points to him. And I hope that we can grab hold of the greatness of who he is and what he has done and what he has accomplished and that we get to be part of it. We leave the natural things behind and we enter into that relation, that spiritual relationship with Christ. And we become not just like him, we have the same spiritual DNA as he does. And God 
will use us to bring glory to his name. Because it's not us working, it is him working in us and through us. As his bride, as his counterpart, as his body. All for the glory of Christ. So I hope you get a little glimpse of who Jesus is. And again, over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at different individuals and how their experiences point to Jesus or how Jesus is the fulfillment of things that took place in the Old Testament. And we get to see how great our Lord is in all that he has accomplished through his life on this earth and through his, his life in heaven being poured out into us. Well, God bless you. Have a great day and I, I'll see you next time.